Hello class and welcome to our fourth module on Covenant. Um, this may be the most important Old Testament theological concept that we will discuss in this class because um, to really understand the rest of the Old Testament, all of the Old Testament and also the, uh, the New Testament, um, having a, a proper understanding of Covenant is really critical. Um, and it's interesting because it is one of the hardest uh, words to define. We use this word all the time. In fact, uh, when we use our names for these volumes of these um, books in our Bible, the Old Testament, the New Testament, uh, we actually use the Latin word for covenant, testamentum. So uh, our very idea of what the Bible is is related to what the covenant is. And yet, um, this is one of the most hotly debated things in theology, um, Old Testament theology at least. Um, and it has been for um, about 70 years or so. So we're going to look at two rival concepts of covenant. The first concept that has been proposed or recently actually, but, but this is the one that has the, the most weight and that you f run into most commonly, is that a covenant is a legal document uh, akin to a treaty. So it, uh, it makes, um, it lays down certain expectations on both parties who promise certain things to each other and um, are expected to meet certain conditions and basically it's like a treaty. Uh, or a, another idea, and the one that we will adopt in this course, is that covenant, although it does have legal ramifications, is really a way of establishing familial bonds akin to adoption or marriage. Um, but, and and there, these ideas can overlap some, um, I don't want to make it entirely like you have to select one or the other, uh, but generally uh, biblical scholars tend to favor one or the other of these two concepts of covenant, either as a legal treaty or as a, uh, a, an adoptive ritual that creates family. Um, the idea about treaties, uh, this became very prominent through the work of a scholar named George Mendenhall. And what happened uh, in the 30s and 40s uh, as they were um, discovering all of these documents from the ancient Near East, they began to uncover uh, many uh, um, cuneiform documents in Asia Minor. Now, um, although uh, these are, this people that produced these documents, they're often called the Hittites, um, and that was because there's a people group that we run into in the Old Testament very frequently. They're called the Hittites all over the place. And we didn't know who they were. And so uh, when we discovered um, this new language that no one knew from Asia Minor, um, they determined that these must be the Hittites. Um, and what we know today is that actually the Hittites of the Old Testament are not what scholars came to call the Hittites today. Um, the Hittites of the Old Testament, uh, the Hittim, that's just another name for Canaanite. That was um, a, a designation of the Canaanite peoples that was used primarily by uh, like the, Akkad, the Assyrians and Babylonians. They referred to uh, Canaan as Hattu. So uh, when we talk about Hittites in the Bible, they're just talking about Canaanites who lived in what is now Israel. Um, when, so this is a little confusing because um, when we talk about the Hittite language and the Hittite documents and Hittite treaties, we're talking about the language that was spoken not in Canaan but in Asia Minor. And for lack of a better term, we will call these people Hittites, even though they're not the Hittites of the Bible. Uh, that's a uh, modern fallacy that unfortunately we're stuck with and we can't, can't uh, change that right now. It's too late. The damage has been done. In any case, um, George Mendenhall, he was um, interpreting these, these uh, tablets 
that were found in Asia Minor in this um, Indo-European language that we call Hittite. It's not a Semitic language like Hebrew or um, Akkadian. Now most, most of the time when we think of uh, cuneiform, when we think about tablets that are written with cuneiform, we're thinking of the language of Akkadian. It's a cognate to Hebrew. It's a Semitic language. This language is very, uh, it's a lot more closer, closely related to Greek and Latin and to German and to our uh, language of English. Um, for instance, the Hittite word for water is wataru. So uh, this is something that uh, we have f some familiarity with. It's a language that uh, was not too hard for us to decipher because it's an Indo-European language like our own. Um, as they were deciphering these documents, they came across entire caches, uh, libraries, of, of treaties between the Hittites and other peoples. And as they interpreted these, um, they, they came across a certain pattern that a lot of these, these uh, treaties or these covenants, as they will call them, um, a lot of these have the pattern of what is called a suzerainty treaty. And um, a suzerainty treaty is a agreement between a king or an emperor and a lesser king, a vassal king, or a suzerain. Um, and so this king, he will f offer protection to this vassal king and to his kingdom in exchange for so many taxes a year and so on. Uh, as long as the lesser king pays tribute to the greater king year after year, then the greater king is obliged to help protect the lesser kingdom. All right? Um, and this is a very common occurrence. This has happened throughout history, um, certainly in the ancient Near East, but also around the world. Until very recently, this would have, for instance, have been the relationship between um, England and India, or England and Australia, or uh, the British colonies uh, in America and uh, Great Britain. So th this is uh, something that we even have in modern times. Um, at this time, this was a very, very prevalent situation. Um, there were hardly any um, au completely autonomous kingdoms in the ancient Near East. Even uh, the kingdoms of Judea in the south and of Israel in the north, uh, they were very often in vassal-type relationships with other kingdoms. Um, for instance, uh, this is what uh, Jerusalem gets into trouble with at the very end of their uh, autonom autonomy is that uh, they begin, uh, they're supposed to be a suzerain to uh, Babylon, but they begin to communicate with Egypt about the possibility of rebelling against um, their, the kingdom above them. And so Nebuchadnezzar comes and destroys their kingdom. And this is uh, what we're talking about here. Well, the Hittites, they had this kind of relationship with other lesser kingdoms around them as well. And um, all of these start off with a historical prologue, and kind of setting the situation, explaining why we're having the treaty. And so one king will say, uh, my fathers had a relationship with your fathers, and uh, they, they were friends of, of old, and that they took care of one another. And so based on this, then, um, we now cut a covenant with one another. But I, the king, am in charge of you, the lesser king, you, the vassal king. And these are the things that I expect of you. And, and then you will have a series of laws, expectations. So uh, to be in covenant, to be in a peace treaty with the greater king, you are expected to meet all of these conditions. Um, and then um, after they uh, spell that out, then somewhere in this document, it will usually uh, also lay out the, uh, the obligations of the greater king. So as long as the lesser king meets these laws, these legal stipulations, then the greater king 
is obliged to come to his aid, the lesser king's aid, um, if they're under attack. They recognize one another now as being in a treaty relationship. And if someone attacks the lesser king, that is recognized as an attack on the greater king. Um, at the end of this um, document, there's always a, an oath. They, they, uh, the two kings, they swear fealty to one another. They um, promise to come to one another's assistance. They promise not to attack one another. They are friends. Um, and they also invoke the names of all of the gods the, that the different parties worship. And so in this way, they establish... Um, they they make this covenant, this treaty, they make it a sacred thing that anyone would fear to break. If you invoke the gods, um, you are not likely to break your covenant because the gods have been called as a witness to it. And, and so uh, there is this uh, sort of superstitious fear that uh, if you break the covenant, then the gods are going to come and get you because you have broken the covenant. So this is the basic model of the suzerain treaty. Uh, what Mendenhall saw was a superficial, let's say, superficial affinity between this, uh, these documents and the covenant in the book of Exodus, and in really the rest of the Mosaic Law as well, but especially the book of Exodus. We, uh, we talk about the chapters that follow the uh, Ten Commandments, so from Exodus 20 on, um, this is called the Book of the Covenant. And he looked at these and he saw some, um, some parallels between them. So you have two um, distinct entities who come into an agreement with each other. But one of these entities is greater than the other. So here you have, you have God, he is the great king, and then you have Israel, which is this vassal kingdom. Um, there are all these legal stipulations that the lesser kingdom is expected to meet. So you have all of the laws of the covenant in the Mosaic Law. Israel is expected to meet all of these conditions in order to enjoy the benefits of the covenant. So we, we can see this parallel as well. Um, there is before all of the laws of the covenant, you have a historical prologue. You could see the entire book of Genesis as a historical prologue, a very long extended historical prologue to the book of the covenant in Exodus. Um, and so Mendenhall, he makes this argument that really all of the, the historical narrative in the law of Moses functions as this historical prologue, such as you would find in the Hittite covenants. And, and then you have the oaths that they swear to one another. Um, if you look at Exodus 24, this is a very clear instance of um, a ritual in which Israel promises to uphold the covenant that they have with God. And God also swears by his own name to be faithful to the covenant and to um, deliver them from their enemies. So you have the same uh, obligation on, on both parties to uphold the covenant, and God is uh, obliged to protect Israel as long as they fulfill the covenant. Um, and and uh, God, of course, being a party of the covenant, he doesn't invoke other gods. Israel being monotheistic, they don't invoke, invoke other gods, in fact. But instead, God's own name is invoked, both by God himself and by Israel. And so, you seem to have all of these uh, items from a suzerainty treaty. Um, and, and this is what Mendenhall argued. And this has really held the day in uh, Old Testament studies for several decades. This is, um, and even today, uh, there are a great many scholars who think that this is pretty much how uh, the, the Old Testament works. This is, this is pretty much what a covenant is. There is a long history, really, that comes before Mendenhall that predisposes um, Old Testament scholars to think in these terms. And, and this history goes clear back to the translation of the Old Testament into Greek, into the Septuagint. So about 200 BC, um, when the Law of Moses was first translated into Greek, uh, when they came to the word covenant, the, the Hebrew word for covenant is brit, and um, they had to make a decision, what Greek word are they going to use? 
and there were several choices. Um, they could have gone with a word like sinteke, and a sinteke is um, a it's kind of a, a the sort of word you would use for a marriage or an adoption ceremony. Um, it, it, it's a family building ritual, but this is not the word that they chose. Uh, instead, they chose an obscure Greek word that is used mostly in legal documents, especially in wills and testaments, um, especially in Alexandria, where the uh, Septuagint was translated. So that makes a little bit of sense. But, but they chose the word diatheke. And a diatheke, um, it's limited, as I said, primarily to wills and testaments. Uh, when, when someone dies, then they break out the diatheke, they break the seal to see what the uh, person, the testator, has left, bequeathed to his family and loved ones. So this is, this is primarily what a diatheke is. We do not know why. We do not know why um, the translators chose this word rather than syntheke. Um, as I said, syntheke is more prevalent. It's a, a more widely used Greek word outside of scripture. But when the translators chose this for the Law of Moses, they set a precedent that has not been broken. Um, so later, when they translate the rest of the books of the Old Testament, and actually when they're translate, or, um, writing books in Greek, some of the books of the Old Testament in the Catholic Bible, uh, such as the Wisdom of Solomon, they will use this word as well, rather than um, the, the word syntheke. And then when the New Testament is being composed, the New Testament writers, they also use this word diatheke. And I think it's probably simply because that was the word that was already used in the Law of Moses. Uh, there's already this um, Old Testament religious vocabulary, so why uh, create a new vocabulary for composing the New Testament? I, I, this is my uh, guess about why this is. In any case, the choice of this very legal word, diatheke, uh, sets a precedent for seeing the covenant in terms of legal traditions rather than in uh, terms of family. Um, so when the um, Latin uh, Bible is being translated, when before Jerome you have the Vetus Latina, the old Latin translation, what word do they use? Uh, they usually use the word testamentum, a testament. So uh, again, uh, we know of this word even from English. Uh, when you hear the word testament, you think of someone's last will and testament, don't you? So this also has the strong legal overtones. Now, it's not treaties. We're not talking about peace treaties here, but uh, we are talking about a legal document. We're not talking about a ritual. We're not talking about a uh, relationship. We're talking about uh, a, a testament is something you can read. And this is kind of the direction this is was taking in the early church in terms of thinking of covenant. Um, another word that appears sometimes to translate diatheke is the word foidus, a treaty. This really is a treaty. So we have these two words, testamentum and foidus, a treaty. Um, both very legal um, terms and both um, very um, they, they refer to something that can be written and read more than the uh, kind of uh, invisible bond that we recognize in uh, relationships. So, uh, with all of this long history preceding Mendenhall, um, later you have something called covenant theology that develops in um, the Reformation period. And covenant theology uh, speaks of, of covenant almost exclusively in legal terms. Um, they, they see it, uh, I'm going to oversimplify things a great deal, but um, a covenant theologian would lay things out more or less like this. Look, we were at war with God. Jesus comes, and in his flesh, he prepares a peace treaty between man and God, and, and he becomes our peace, our, our peace between between us and God. He uh, bridges this gap between us. And so now, through the work of Jesus on the cross, 
we're no longer at war with God, but we actually have a treaty with him. Uh, and this is about as far as they get. Now, this doesn't mean that they, they don't have any sentimental or um, emotional bond to God. But um, I, I do want to stress that this is a, a matter of, of they, they couch the way the redemption works in legal terms. Um, also, they're just following the, uh, the work of Martin Luther in this as well, with his very forensic explanation of justification, that um, we were declared guilty for our sins by God, there had been a sentence passed against us, someone has to suffer the consequences for those crimes, and so Jesus, he suffers on our behalf, we are um, declared guiltless, um, nothing has substantively changed about us and who we are. We're not, in fact, made righteous, but we are declared righteous. This is the theology of Martin Luther. So covenant theology takes this uh, hyper-legalistic explanation of salvation, and it applies it to covenant. And, and, and this is what we get. Mendenhall, uh, being a Protestant, he comes from this uh, tradition. And so he continues to explain covenant in very legalistic terms, and, and it, it makes sense for him when he he sees the discovers these documents. Um, he's not the one who discovered them, but he's he was he becomes aware of them, begins to translate them into English. He gets excited because he sees how they also they uh, connect with his conceptions of what a covenant is. They also um, another thing that is provoking Mendenhall is, uh, remember, at this stage in uh, biblical research, uh, you have the documentary hypothesis holding the day. And they had been pushed the composition of the Mosaic Law of Torah way, way back to after the exile, many scholars were. They're saying that uh, very little actually went back to Moses. So uh, they're saying that, that most of the Mosaic Law is composed uh, in the Persian period. You're, you're talking about in the 500s, 400s, 300s even BC, okay? 300 years before Christ. Um, the treaties that Mendenhall found, they were uh, composed around 1400, 1300 BC. And, and this was good news for Mendenhall and for other, uh, we will call them maximalist Bible interpreters who wanted the majority of these texts to um, be attributed to Moses and to people of that, that era, um, a more traditionalist reading of, of Scripture. And, and so um, I think Mendenhall was attempting to connect the Old Testament to these older documents, very, very old documents, in hopes that it would um, lend credence to the idea that that. Moses himself had written the law attributed to him. So th that he has um, kind of an ideological motive as well, is my point. Um, is, is covenant, from a Hebrew point of view, is it actually a legal treaty? Is that a good way to describe it? Does it fit this pattern of, of a suzerainty treaty? Um, now, I, I, I don't want you to completely uh, disregard this. I, I think that Mendenhall makes some good points. Um, but what I'm going to suggest is that covenant is actually very multifaceted. Uh, there's no one correct way of interpreting it. In fact, the, the more different directions, angles you can, you can come at it, the better. A and let's start with the very word for covenant in Hebrew. This is something that Mendenhall completely disregarded and that most covenant scholars have disregarded. Let's start at the very beginning. Let's start with the word brit. This is what a covenant is called in Hebrew. Um, there's a lot of debate about that, what this word means. Um, I, the best uh, opinion that I've come across, the best answer, is the suggestion that comes from the word bara. Um, the word bara in Hebrew means food. Uh, if someone is fat, you say that they are bari, they are full of food. Um, they're well fed, would be another way to translate it. Bari is well fed. Um, so 
bara being food, brit, it could be um, a food ritual. That could be one way to translate it. And this makes sense because very often when we encounter covenants in the Old Testament and outside of the Old Testament as well, we find that one of the major components of building a covenant between yourself and someone else or between one people group and another is to invite them to eat together. Um, it, it's hard for us to conceptualize how intimate eating was considered in the ancient world and in particular by the Hebrews. The, um, the Mishnah, which is written, hence compiled about 200 years after the time of Christ. But even that late um, in the Mishnah, they, they describe um, how someone would be um, ashamed to eat in the street. They, they don't want to do it in front of everybody. They go back into their shop to eat because it's not the sort of thing you do in public. You, you don't just sit down, you don't have McDonald's back then, you don't just sit down just anywhere and break open your lunch and start eating. Um, you don't sit down to somebody that you don't know very well and have a meal. It's, it's not the sort of thing that you would do. Uh, to be invited to share a meal with someone was a very great honor, a distinct honor, because you're saying you are your family. You, um, you belong with me, uh, especially if you're eating meat. Um, meat is a very important aspect of covenant. Um, anytime you have a banquet, you're, eat, you're bringing out the best food, and, and meat is a rarity in this day. So part of the, what the most common phrase for est establishing a covenant relationship with someone is in Hebrew, to cut a covenant. And there's a lot of debate. What does it mean to cut a covenant? And I think that probably the best explanation of cutting a covenant is that this is the slaughtering of the sacrificial meal, of the animal that the two parties are going to feast upon. So you cut a covenant with someone, you slaughter a, a sacrificial animal that you are going to eat. Now you have shared a covenant. You've entered into a covenant with them by eating. So this, this idea that the word breed actually means food Covenant food um, makes a lot of sense to me. It fits with a lot of the things we see associated with covenant in the Old Testament. Um, we, we see this word breed um, used. Sometimes it, it is used of treaties. Sometimes we do see treaty-like arrangements with this word. What's interesting, when, when this is the case, uh, the two parties who have a treaty with one another then use family language to, dis to describe one another. So before they may have been enemies, now they have a peace treaty. They're not friends, that's not the word that's used of them. It doesn't describe them as allies. It doesn't use them in, it doesn't describe them in words that we as moderns in the West would use at all. It usually uses the word brother. Before they're enemies and now they are brothers after they enter into the covenant. It uses the idea of family. And these uh, covenants are always celebrated in a banquet atmosphere. They eat together, and so they're family. The closest thing I can think of to compare this with would be Thanksgiving. So, uh, in the West, we don't really have these uh, taboos about eating with people we're not very close to. We will have business meals and so on. Um, but there is one time a year when we tend to only eat with family. Um, although we're getting past this a little, I've noticed. But uh, usually for Thanksgiving, you want to go home and have dinner with your family. Um, you want uh, to... You, you don't want to just eat with anybody. You don't go to the restaurant. Also, if somebody just showed up at, at your door uh, for Thanksgiving, um, you might be polite and let them eat with you, but you probably have some things to say when they had left. Uh, like, what was that all about? Like, you know, why did he just welcome himself to sit down and start eating with us? He's not part of the family, right? Um, it feels weird for someone to... You would feel like there was an intrusion if someone did that. Um, and this, I think, is pretty much how the ancient Near Eastern world felt about meat in general. 
you only ate meat for special occasions. So if you eat meat with someone, your family, um, and it's a big deal. You would use this word breed um, for treaties, but you would also use it, and this I think is really important, you would use it for marriage. If you, uh, in the book of Jeremiah, in the book of Hosea, the word breed is used of marriage specifically, and I think this is probably the best model of what covenant is for us. Um, and this comes straight, we, today even, we will describe marriage as being a covenant. And, and that comes right from the Old Testament, where we are maintaining a very old tradition indeed. And sometimes, uh, breed can also describe other uh, forms of family uh, relationships, or family building relationships. What all of these have um, to tie them together, everything from a, tr a peace treaty between two nations and a marriage, any time that there's a covenant, there's always a religious connotation. It is never just a secular uh, event. You, you, you're not just going over to the courthouse and signing a piece of paper that has legal weight to it, but you're actually um, saying a lot of prayers, you're offering sacrifices, and you're calling God as a witness to the, the, new, the new relationship that you have with the other party. Um, one of the, the best uh, depictions, the best uh, models of what we're talking about here can be found in Genesis chapter 26. Uh, this describes the, uh, the covenant between Isaac and Abimelech. Isaac has been having trouble with the Philistines. Um, he'll go somewhere, move somewhere, dig a well, and the Philistines come by and they fill it with dirt. Um, eventually, Avimelech, the king of the Philistines, comes through, um, wants to visit with Isaac. Now, we got to remember that Isaac is a man of considerable substance. He is a very, very, very wealthy individual. And um, so, even though he's not a king, he does not, you know, he's not leading some uh, tribe or something. He, he doesn't have a large family. He only has two sons. And yet, um, he has a huge amount of servants, and he has a great amount of wealth, probably much more than Abimelech, the king of the Philistines. Um, remember, we're talking about city-states. We're not talking about kingdoms in the way that we tend to conceptualize them after the European model. So we're talking about a, uh, a king of a city-state in the Philistines. And um, probably, a, you know, we call him a king in our translations, but probably chieftain is probably not far off the mark. So uh, Isaac is considered not just as an equal, but perhaps a superior. He's a threat. To, uh, to Abimelech. I keep wanting to use the Hebrew uh, pronunciation, Avimelech. So he's a threat to Avimelech. And, um, and so probably what you have going on, first of all, with, with stopping up all these wells, is uh, maybe a way to communicate to him that he's not welcome there. Get along. You know, I, I don't really want you in my territory. And when Isaac uh, continues to remain in that, that region, he doesn't just shuffle off. Uh, when Isaac uh, shows that he means to stay there, Avimelech has to take another approach. And he, um, he, he's now very concerned because uh, perhaps Isaac is, is upset with him. Uh, for stopping up all his wells. And so he shows up and, and he's like, how you doing, buddy? And uh, Isaac said, you know, I've been meaning to talk to you. Um, a lot of your servants have been filling my wells up with dirt. And Avimelech says, oh, really? I never knew. Why didn't you tell me about it? And um, I, I think probably he knew very well what was going on. Uh, that, that's the feeling I get from the text. Uh, how could you not know that this sort of thing is going on? In any case, um, Isaac, he, he pulls out seven sheep, and, he sa and uh, Abimelech says, what are these for? And um, Isaac says, well, I'm going to purchase this well, this well at Beersheba, 
I'm going to purchase this well with these seven sheep. And Abimelech says, okay, um, yeah, do whatever you want. And the thing about seven, and the number seven, it sounds exactly the same as the Hebrew word for uh, oath. So they, uh, to, a sheva is the number seven, but it's also an oath. So they swear an oath on these seven sheep on this well. And so the well of Beersheba becomes the well of the seven or the well of the oath. And that's what's known as to this day. I lived there for nine years within walking distance of that well um, for nine years. It was kind of cool. So um, they, they make this agreement. They eat together. And then uh, notice in verse 31, Genesis 26, 31, um, it says in, in every English translation, uh, they, they miss this. They, they just translate it simply as, in the morning they rose early and took oath with one another. So they make a promise to one another. What they miss is that in the Hebrew, what it literally says is each man promised, each man swore to his brother. The night before their enemies, in the morning they rise up and they are brothers. And so they swear fealty to one another over these seven sheep. Um, what it's saying is now they're family. Uh, before they were enemies, now they're family. And, and so uh, Abimelech can no longer give um, Isaac any trouble. He can't go around filling up his, his wells with dirt because you wouldn't do that to your brother. Um, although I know some people who would, but <laughs> let's not talk about that. Isaac is not going to do that uh, sort of thing to Abimelech. He's not going to be a threat to Abimelech, even though he has enough money, enough servants, that he could be a political threat to Abimelech. Um, but they've, they've got a covenant with each other. They're family. You don't do that to family. That's the point of the covenant. Um, it is a peace treaty, but it's not just a peace treaty. That's my point. It's a peace treaty that creates real substantive relationship. It, it, it creates a deep and profound relationship to the point that you can call the other party a brother. And, and that is not just a, a, a fiction. It's not a legal fiction. They conceptualize this as being completely true. They, they have adopted one another and they recognize each other as family now, as kin. This, this, is, this is exactly what's happened. So what do you need if you're wanting to cut a covenant with somebody? What do you need? Well, first of all, as I was saying, you need a food. You need food. You need a, an animal to slaughter that you're going to eat together. Uh, when you cut the covenant, when you slaughter the animal, you uh, provide meat. And some of this meat will then be sacrificed. So not only are you providing food for one another, you are providing a sacrifice for the God whose name you are going to invoke when you swear to one another. So you have meat for yourselves, you also have meat for, for the God that you are worshiping together. You are also producing blood for the sacrificial rite as well. And um, in uh, Leviticus chapter 17 it says the life is in the blood. A li uh, blood has this sacramental a mysterious quality of life in it and by letting out this life and by applying it to the altar and applying it to the other parties involved you have a communion in life together that um, then it kind of becomes the the glue for the covenant the blood the life force in the blood is the glue that brings people together seals them together um, as I said you need the sacrifice to offer to the God whose name you're going to invoke. Um, God, or gods, depending on your um, religious uh, background, you, God or the gods are the witnesses of the covenant. They are the ones who are watching this all transpire, and they're the ones who will hold both parties accountable to one another. So, as I was saying, there's always a religious connotation to covenant cutting. Uh, it, it's never just a legal uh, transaction. It's, it's a religious one as well. And um, it has, 
of course, it has um, legal um, connotations. It's not that it's not legal, but uh, for for the ancient Near East, uh, a legal fiction would not have mattered so much. You put it in paper, you can burn it. You can, you know, if you scratch it into stone, you can smash it. If you uh, stamp it onto a clay tablet, you can break it. But if you call the gods to witness it, then that's what really matters. What happens in a religious connotation is extremely important for the people of the ancient Near East. And that is what is going to um, hold people accountable to fulfill their promises to one another. Um, so uh, let's look at marriage. Marriage, as I said, I think is the best example of covenant for us. Uh, what do you have even today, when people become married, they, um, what happens? It, it's a covenant. You have two parties who were distinct. Hopefully they weren't enemies before they got married. <laughs> but you have two parties, two distinct uh, entities that before the covenant ritual are, are not recognized as one. But after the covenant ritual, they're declared to be one flesh. They are made into one unit. They become family. A family is created, um, even without children yet. You, a man and his wife are a family. Um, and they've become a family unit, whereas before they were two distinct entities. So this is the first thing that we see. Um, covenant creates family. If you hear nothing else in this module, that's what I want you to, to know, is that a covenant always generates a family bond. And this is what happens with marriage. What else do we do with marriages? We eat. We have lots and lots of food. So we eat together. Um, I, we do this because we remember... Now, if you go to a uh, wedding in a Christian church like I grew up in, they're getting better about this, but um, it used to be you go to one of these weddings and what would they have after the marriage ceremony? They would have punch and those little like butter mints and maybe some peanuts. So um, it wasn't that great of a party. I tell you what, Catholics know how to party. Um, we get married and we break out the booze, right? Um, and, and there's lots of good food and um, we have a good time. And, and that's really important for, for marriages, uh, for, for weddings, because um, this is an old tradition. You uh, celebrate a new family relationship with food and feasting, and everyone eats together to, like Thanksgiving, to express this family bond that we have with one another. We also, as Catholics, we have the sacrifice of the Mass. So um, the, the central component of most Catholic uh, weddings is actually the Eucharist, is the, the sacrifice of the Mass. So again, we, we've kept this old ancient tradition of, um, of, of uh, offering sacrifices to um, call God as a witness. Um, we've maintained this tradition even in our, our Christian weddings. And then also, every, every wedding um, kind of revolves around what? The, uh, the marriage vows, these oaths, these sacred oaths that a, a man and a wife make to one another. Um, these are legally binding oaths. We get a marriage license. Uh, it's a legal document. But if I treated my marriage as a legal fiction, um, my, my wife is probably going to treat a lot of other aspects of my marriage as a fiction as well. Um, if, if all that a marriage is is just legal, like a legal expression, then you wouldn't have much of a, a marriage. It's, it's all, what really makes a marriage is not that, that piece of paper that's signed at the courthouse. What really makes a marriage is the relationship that is generated through these vows, through, um, through the sacrament, um, through all of the, becoming a family unit. That, that's what marriage is. The, the legal, it's not that the legal um, 
construct of, of marriage is not important. It is important. But, but that legal construct serves the family bond that is generated in the wedding ceremony. I, I hope you can understand what I'm saying here. Um, th this is what we have in the ancient Near East, I think. I I'm convinced of this, that when you read about covenants in the Old Testament, it's the same sort of thing. There is a legal aspect to it. And so in that respect, Mendenhall wasn't completely off the mark. But if that's all it is, if all that a covenant does is <laughs> mean that God and, and Israel, now they can be friends, and they have to follow the law and, and uh, protect, you know, God has to protect Israel. If that's all it is, it's pretty boring and wooden. But if it creates family, then we have something that has life and vibrancy to it. And, and I'm convinced this is the way to, to think of covenant in the Old Testament. Uh, one of the things that we encounter with covenants, Mendenhall writes about this at great length, is that covenants uh, have... One of the obligations of a covenant is that you are... Um, if, if you enter into war, then the person who is in covenant with you is obliged to defend you, to come to your aid. Um, they, they are in um, alliance with you. Now, it's not just like the, uh, you know, NATO. It's not just that you have these, these nations that have these sworn agreements with each other. It, it's deeper than that. It, it's a recognition. It's like, it's more like, you know, down in the South, if you miss with mess with one guy, you're going to mess with his brother, his cousin, and his cousin's sister's stepfather, right? Um, that's the sort of stuff you're going to run into in the South. Um, and that's kind of the way it is in the ancient Near East, too. If you, if you pick on somebody who's in covenant with someone else, then the, the other party of that covenant is obliged not, not just because they signed their name on the dotted line, but because that's kin. You're picking on, you know, my kin. And so if you mess with them, you're going to mess with me too. But it's not only just international agreements. Um, it it's also has importance for our uh, agreements for, um, for your society. So if you are going off to war... You want to be in covenant with all of the other soldiers in the army. You, you don't want to um, have you know, personal vendettas with someone because uh, they might just leave you uh, to get killed on the front line. Or they might take advantage of the chaos in the middle of the uh, melee to, uh, you know, to stab you. And, you know, no one's going to notice. You know, no one's going to know that it was you that killed them and not, and not the enemy. Um, so covenant is extremely important for warfare. You want everyone to be in covenant with one another and the same team. So uh, there, there are all of these other um, ramifications of covenant that we don't think about um, just at a surface level. You, you have to meditate on this a little bit. Now, um, there are covenants all over the Bible, covenants all over the Old Testament in particular. Uh, what are some of the major covenants of Scripture? And you could look at this um, as though God, salvation history is really a series of covenants that God has made with His people. And, and each covenant deepens His relationship until you get to the covenant that comes through Jesus that is uh, most profound. Uh, through Jesus, we, we are adopted as sons into God's family, as sons and daughters. Of, um, of God. So, um, the first covenant I think we find in the Old Testament is that between God and Adam and Eve. Um, he uh, creates them. They are the lords of creation. He entrusts everything to their care. Um, it, it, it's never spelled out that this is a covenant, but um, this, I think, is the original covenant between man and God. And we were created in a co covenant relationship with God. And the fall 
is all about how this family relationship, this covenant relationship, is broken through the poor choice of our first parents. The next major covenant that you find is God's covenant with Noah. Um, notice, as we look at these covenants, you're going to see that all of these kind of become more narrow. Uh, God starts with our parents, all of our parents, Adam and Eve. Then um, most of humanity is wiped out in the flood, but God chooses this one family, eight people on a boat. He chooses them through whom to build his family relationship that's going to continue through history. So the covenant with Noah. You can read about this in uh, Genesis chapter 9. And then you have the covenant with Abraham. It becomes more narrow. Um, so God chooses one family, one man from all of the peoples on earth. He chooses one man through whom he will um, bring the chosen people and later the Messiah. And so he makes a covenant, the covenant of circumcision with Abraham. In a, so we find this in Genesis chapter 12. God calls Abraham from Ur of the Chaldees and um, sends him to the promised land, makes promises to him saying that I will um, establish my covenant with you and give you seed at, that will fill, you know, be as many as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Then later, um, through Abraham's descendants on Mount Sinai, on Exodus chapter 24, we have a very major covenant that is cut with Israel. We'll look at this in just a little bit. Then you have the Davidic covenant. God uh, takes one family from all of Israel, and he says, I will uh, make it so that your seed will always be on the throne. And, and so he gives us the covenant with David. And then finally, you have um, all of this kind of narrows down until you get to Mary. And uh, the angel comes to Mary, says, um, Hail, highly favored one. Hail, you who have been uh, given grace for all time. Um, the Lord is with you. And that's a very covenantal type of statement. Um, when uh, God says, uh, every time he mentions the covenant in the law of Moses, he says things like, you will be my people and I will be your God. I will be with you. So when, when the angel says, the Lord is with you, this is a very covenantal statement. And through Mary, then, we have Jesus who will give us the new covenant in his blood. And, and then what's interesting is this kind of narrowing down, this kind of hourglass shape that we have. Here we get to Jesus, the most narrow. Everything hinges on him. And then all of a sudden, what happens? It blows wide open. And the covenant, you know, God's been kind of restricting his family through these covenants, drawing people into deeper relationship, but also a more narrow, exclusive relationship with him. And now, as Jesus comes, this family relationship is broken wide open through Jesus to all peoples and, and deepened, um, more, more profound than anyone could have dreamed of, that we can be the sons and daughters of God. Um, th this is what happens through Jesus. So this is kind of a, a very brief um, sketch of salvation history as viewed through the covenant. Let's look at Exodus chapter 24 again. Um, if you look at Exodus 24, uh, you have a lot of um, interesting, strange, ritualistic stuff going on. They slaughter all of these, um, these bulls, and, and they collect the blood in these bulls. And then notice in verse 8, what does Moses do with the blood that he's collected in the bowls? He takes it and he throws it on the people. Now, according to um, the numbers in the law of Moses, you're talking about 600,000 fighting men. So you're talking maybe 6 million people that some people think about. Obviously not every single person. You know, Moses isn't like throwing the blood in the air and it's like, you know, covering all of them. Uh, so you have some kind of figurative language going on here. Nonetheless, um, we have this idea that the blood of the covenant, the blood that's been spilled out, has been um, thrown on the people, it's been applied to the people. Um, they, they are now uh, partakers of the blood of the covenant. Some of the blood then is also poured out on the altar, at the base of the altar. 
and then the the meat of these animals that were slaughtered for this to provide this blood, then some of the meat is burned on the altar. But um, there's a word for these sacrifices. We'll talk more about this later. There's a word for these sacrifices. They're called the peace offerings. So this means that not only is the meat offered on the altar to God, the meat is also eaten by the people, specifically by the 70 elders. Um, notice in verse 11, the 70 elders, they go up the mountain with Moses, and look what it says. God did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God. They saw God. Something the Bible elsewhere says it cannot happen. We cannot see God and live. And yet these people, after they come through the covenant, after the blood of the covenant is applied to them, they can actually behold God and live. And not only do they behold God and live, but they eat and drink in God's presence. What are they eating? They're eating, and they're eating the meat that was sacrificed earlier. The, the meat that, that uh, produced the blood that they've um, been baptized in. The, this, so it all goes together. And here they are, sitting at the feet of God, enjoying a meal with him. Uh, it's Thanksgiving. They're, they're all sitting down and eating a meal. Um, God has gotten his portion on the altar. They're all sitting down, eating together like their family. And this is the ideal picture of covenant. This is what God wants for his people. To sit with him around his throne, enjoying a meal together. It took hundreds of years for God to bring this to pass in his son Jesus. And this is what we get in Jeremiah chapter 31. Uh, we're told that the days will come when there will be a new covenant. A new covenant. Uh, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant, which they broke. Though I was their husband, says the Lord. I was their husband. Here, uh, Jeremiah uses the... Uh, the most profound image of covenant that we, we have, that of marriage, and he applies it to God's relationship with Israel. So here they are in Exodus 24, eating, drinking together like a man and his new bride. And then what do they do? Just, you know, days later, Exodus 24, here they are um, eating, drinking with God. A few chapters later, what are they doing? Golden calf. They break the first of the Ten Commandments that they're given by uh, making a golden calf and worshiping it. So um, they, they can't keep the covenant because the covenant is outside of them. It, it's not on their hearts. So God's going to fix this with a new covenant. He's going to make a new covenant with Israel. This is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it upon their hearts and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. A new covenant is coming. A new covenant. So Jesus comes, and he brings this covenant to, uh, to his people, and he, he holds on the, uh, the night that he's betrayed as he's celebrating the Last Supper with them. He, he holds the chalice, and he says, This is is the, the cup of the new covenant in my blood. He, he intentionally evokes the language of Jeremiah, and he intentionally evokes the, uh, the symbolism of Exodus 24. The blood of the covenant that was poured out over all of Israel, now Jesus is saying, my blood is about to be poured out into this new chalice, this new chalice of the new covenant that is, is for everyone now. It, it's, it's for the many. It's for you. So, um, so this is the new covenant. Jeremiah looks forward to. Jesus says, here it is. And, and now the law, it's, it, the covenant's not just external, but now it is engraved on our hearts. Um, the fourth Eucharistic prayer of the Roman Missal, I think, um, really summarizes what we're talking about with this beautiful, beautiful statement. 
It says, even when he disobeyed you and lost your friendship, you did not abandon him to the power of death. Again and again, you offered a covenant to man. 